So with the lead now broken, we quickly move to battle between England and France. And the next scene, as I said before, gives us a series of victories, very rapid victories on England's side. The bastard arrives with the head of Austria that he's taken as his trophy. And so he's now paid back Austria for murdering his father, Richard Lionheart. Austria had taken uh, Richard's lion skin trophy as his trophy, and now the bastard has taken Austria's head as payback. And note that the bastard now has fulfilled his earlier promise. He had promised Austria that he would lay on to make his shoulders crack and that he would take the uh, lion skin off of him. So the bastard has fulfilled his promise and again, avenged his father. John arrives with the newly captured Arthur. John also brings news that his mother, Eleanor, is besieged. But as it turns out, even before he's brought the bastard this news, the bastard has already rescued Eleanor. So we see here a repetition of the earlier event when John's forces had so rapidly crossed the channel to arrive in France, even prior to their ambassadors arriving. Now the bastard similarly has uh, displayed the same kind of speed by rescuing Eleanor even before John can bring news of her capture. So we see parallel to John's story, the narrative of John's rise and fall, we see the story of the bastard's rise. And even though the play remains John's play, we'll see that the bastard becomes a more important character uh, and becomes in some way the spokesperson for England and the representative of England's power and potential. After a few further military excursions, John, now victorious, decides to head back to England and he sends the bastard ahead of him in order to raise funds by ransacking the coffers of the church. John says to the bastard, see thou shake the bags of hoarding abbots, imprisoned angels set at liberty, so he refers to the abbots as hoarding, again, criticizing the church or referencing the church's worldliness, its greed. And there's also a pun on angels, meaning both the uh, angelic beings, the spiritual heavenly beings, and also angels, which was a type of coin that he's going to set free from the imprisoning hoarding hands of these abbots. The bastard responds, bell, book, and candle shall not drive me back when gold and silver vex me to come on. Bell, book, and candle here, uh, referencing objects that were used in a certain excommunication rituals. And so the bastard is saying the signs of excommunication, the objects which the, the church uses in its excommunication ritual, are meaningless to me. They have no meaning when gold and silver, things that are truly valuable, are calling to him. The bastard contrasts the false, empty, meaningless signs of the church's authority with the real power, the real value of gold, of currency, of wealth. If you recall how the play ends, John will be poisoned by a monk who is said to be taking revenge for this act, for John's order to uh, pillage the wealth of the church. However, this is really the only time we see this event even referenced. Pandolf will reference it once more later in, the, in this act, but we don't actually see the uh, events being dramatized. They're just a, a minor order that John gives as almost a throwaway moment. So the fact that it ends up being such an important moment, this ultimately is the uh, action that causes John's death or that precipitates John's death, um, is another example of the way this play struggles to try to make meaning out of history, or perhaps highlights the way in which historical events don't necessarily fit into a neat narrative that, that always makes sense. That the events that we focus on, that we dramatize, that are the most interesting, may not in some sense be the most decisive, or that events that sometimes seem minor are, of course, the decisive events, uh, or end up being decisive. Of course, that all depends on where we begin and end a story. Where we choose to begin and end depend, uh, sets what events are going to be important, what ends up being a decisive event relative to the ending that you come to. It becomes all the more odd and ironic when we see what John is about to do and what he's about to consider. John now turns to speak with Hubert, the first citizen of Angiers, who has now become John's confidant. While Eleanor and Arthur are talking uh, to the side, John says to Hubert, Come hither, Hubert. Oh, my gentle Hubert, we owe thee much. Within this wall of flesh there is a soul, counts thee her creditor, and with advantage means, means to pay thy love. And, my good friend, thy voluntary oath lives in this bosom, dearly cherished. Give me thy hand. I had a thing to say, but I will fit it with some better tune. 
By heaven, Hubert, I am almost ashamed to say what good respect I have of thee. Notice John's language of amity, of friendship, of connection, that they uh, that he describes Hubert as his creditor, his friend, that there is an oath that Hubert has made to him, and he says, give me thy hand. So again, we have that physical gesture, that physical bond of joining hands, symbolizing, representing uh, a deeper connection, a deeper union. Notice also, however, that John is very indirect. He says he has a thing to say to Hubert, but doesn't want to say it or can't quite say it. He is almost ashamed to say how much he loves Hubert, how much he values Hubert. So he's being very indirect, suggesting that he wants something, suggesting that there's something he's going to tell Hubert, especially given how much he's flattering Hubert, how much he says he loves Hubert, that he wants something back. He wants something from Hubert in response. When Hubert says that he owes a great deal to the king, I am much bounden to your majesty, John goes on to say, Good friend, thou hast no cause to say so yet, but thou shalt have. And creep time ne'er so slow, yet it shall come for me to do thee good. So he promises future rewards, promises in the future I will do good for you, I will do something for you. And then he continues, repeating himself from earlier, I had a thing to say, but let it go. And why does he not want to say what he has to say? Again, repeating, I have something to say, but I'm not going to say it. That indirection, that unwillingness to come out and be open with his desires. Why is he unwilling to do so? He goes on to explain, the sun is in the heaven and the proud day attended with the pleasures of the world is all too wanton and too full of gods to give me audience. So he describes the day, the sun is out, it's too beautiful, too pleasurable. Everything is, is uh, in bloom and, and loving and alive. So that is not the proper audience for what I have to say. Instead, if the midnight bell did with his iron tongue and brazen mouth sound on into the drowsy race of night, if this same were a churchyard, a graveyard, where we stand and now possessed with a thousand wrongs, or if that surly spirit melancholy had baked thy blood and made it heavy, thick, which else runs tickling up and down the veins, making that idiot laughter keep men's eyes and strain their cheeks to idle merriment, a passion hateful to my purposes. So he says, if it were night, if we were in a graveyard, if you were an evil man possessed of a thousand wrongs, if you were melancholy so your blood was thick and not uh, the light flowing blood that leads to laughter. So if the scene were darker, if the situation were dark and grim, I would be able to say what I want to say. So what's, what is it that he wants to say? He obviously has to say something grim and dark. He continues, or if that thou could see me without eyes, hear me without thine ears, and make reply without a tongue, using conceit alone, without eyes, ears, and harmful sound of words. Then, in despite of brooded watchful day, I would into thy bosom pour my thoughts, but ah, I will not. So if I could communicate without signs, if you knew what I wanted without me having to actually communicate it, to you, not actually even say the words, so you wouldn't even have to hear it, but I could just communicate it directly to you, then I would do it even though the day is watchful, even though the day is watching. So all these uh, uh, images, the images that it's too bright, that he would only do it under cover of dark, he would only do it if there were no signs or sounds of what he wanted to communicate, so no one could see or hear it, all suggests the horror, the, the, gr the great horror and evil of what it is that he is about to, again, indirectly request of Hubert. He's unwilling to come out openly and say what he wants of Hubert, but he, he then says, yet I love thee well, and by my troth, I think thou lovest me well. So his love for Hubert and his uh, belief that Hubert loves him back entices him, makes him feel that perhaps he can tell Hubert what he wants, that he can show Hubert his desire. Hubert says, so well, so well do I love you, that what you bid me undertake, though that my death were adjunct to my act, by heaven I would do it. I love you so much, even if whatever it was that you wanted me to do would cause me to die, I would still do it. 
John now shows Hubert what he wants, but again, doesn't communicate it openly, leaves it to Hubert to interpret John's signs. Good Hubert, 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 throw thine eye on yon young boy. I'll tell thee what, my friend, he is a very serpent in my way. And wheresoever this foot of mine doth tread, he lies before me. Dost thou understand me? Thou art his keeper. So he directs Hubert's eye to the boy and shows Hubert how he feels about the boy, tells Hubert what his interpretation of the boy is. And then to leave it to Hubert to understand what that means, what his desire is. If the boy is a serpent to him, what does he desire Hubert, the keeper, to do? Hubert says, I'll keep him so that he shall not offend your majesty. And then we have a very rapid exchange where, speaking just in images, John manages to communicate to Hubert what he wants. Death, my lord, a grave, he shall not live enough. So just by the images of death and a grave, Hubert understands what it is that John wants, that he wants Hubert, as Arthur's keeper, to eliminate Arthur, to kill him. And Shakespeare intensifies the sense of conspiracy between the two by giving them a shared line. If you notice, this is they speak in just a few words, and this makes up one shared line of verse. So suggesting, uh, which suggests a certain rapidity, again, speed in the back and forth, that this is one word after another, death, my lord, a grave, he shall not live enough. It's very rapid, um, although, of course, smoother than that when delivered by two actors. Uh, and at the same time, the fact that they're sharing one verse line signifies or suggests the, the interwoven nature of their desires, that they are communicating at this very um, uh, uh, kind of interconnected level at a very fundamental level. And John ends their conversation by telling Hubert, I could be merry now. Hubert, I love thee. Well, I'll not say what I intend for thee. Remember. So John here doesn't, again, is indirect, doesn't tell Hubert what he intends for him, what he's going to give him as reward. Um, and if you're a henchman, you should always be a little suspicious when your villainous boss says, I'm not going to tell you what good thing I'm going to give you, but trust me, it'll be good. Because um, what usually happens is the boss, the villainous boss, ends up betraying the henchman. And as we'll see, when Hubert comes and gives John news that Arthur is dead, of course, Hubert's lying at that moment, but when he gives him news, John's reaction is not to thank Hubert for what he's done, but to condemn him for doing it and saying, you shouldn't have done this. You should have known that I really didn't want this. One last thing I want to say about John's rhetoric to Hubert is to note the way it echoes Constance's rhetoric earlier when she had been speaking to Arthur. She had said, if you were ugly and deformed, then I wouldn't care that you've lost your claim to the throne because I wouldn't love you in that case. But you're fair, you're beautiful, you've been made to be the king, so that's why I'm upset. Here, John is inverting that. He says, it is too beautiful right now. It is too nice outside. It is too sunny. It is too bright for me to tell you my dark thoughts. But if it were darker, if it were night, if you were evil, or if I could communicate them to you directly, then I would. So we have the kind of um, echo flipping of that rhetoric. So the final scene of Act 3 takes us over to the French pavilion, where we see the consequences of the English success. Uh, and we have first the French complaining about their defeat at the hands of the English. Then we see Constance, who is going mad with grief from losing her son. And finally, we see Pandolf, who uses his Machiavellian uh, rhetoric to convince Louis to invade England. Philip begins by complaining, So, by a roaring tempest on the flood, a whole armado of convicted sail is scattered and disjoined from fellowship. So there's been a storm that has destroyed a number of the French troops. And this, in some way, um, undercuts the English successes. It makes them seem perhaps less that it was the might of the English and partially the storms. It was partially the weather. And again, it raises the question, is weather providential? Is the weather the sign of God's blessing as the Spanish Armada's defeat, uh, destruction by storms was often interpreted? Or is it just a random action? Again, it depends on whose perspective and it depends on where we end the story. If we end the story here with the French defeat, then the, uh, the storms that, that have destroyed their ships are providential. They are an important event 
uh, that leads to, that's part of the narrative of the English defeating the French. But if we continue on, as the play does, it seems less a decisive event, less something providential, less a sign of God's will, and just a random act of nature. In response to Pandolf's uh, attempt to comfort them, that courage and comfort all shall go well, Philip again complains, what can go well when we have run so ill? Are we not beaten? Is not Angiers lost? Arthur Tain prisoner? Diverse dear friends slain? And bloody England into England gone, or bearing interruption, spite of France? So how could things go well? We've lost. Our friends are dead. Arthur has been taken prisoner, and England has gone back to England. Fr uh, that is, King John has taken his soldiers, his forces back to England. What can we do? And his son Lewis agrees with him. What he hath won, that hath he fortified. So hot a speed, with such advice disposed, such temperate order in so fierce a cause, doth want example. Who hath read or heard of any kindred action like to this? So Lewis here stressing just how amazing uh, England's actions are. There's no example, no one's ever seen anything quite so amazing as their skill in this military uh, conflict. They are both speedy, it's a hot speed, they're so fast, yet with advice, with reason, it's disposed, it's well ordered. And um, they are fierce in their cause, but they are temperate at the same time. So there's an order, yet a ferocity at the same time. So Lewis emphasizes again just how shocking and how surprising England's uh, uh, successes and their efficiency are. And then Constance arrives as if to give a, a very personal, intimate, pained, poignant example of just how devastating the English defeat of the French has been, because to her it is both political and personal. Philip describes her as a grave unto a soul, holding the eternal spirit against her will in the vile prison of afflicted breath. Remember earlier when she had talked about her spirits being at war with herself and wanting to die rather than accept the reality of her son's defeat. Philip echoes that and reinforces that by saying she looks she she looks as if she was the living dead, someone who uh, whose spirit wants to escape from the prison of worldly life and the flesh and all of, of course, the suffering that worldly life brings along with it. Constance cannot be consoled. I defy all counsel, all redress, but that which ends all counsel, true redress, death. Death, O amiable, lovely death, thou odiferous stench, sound rottenness, arise forth from the couch of lasting night, thou hate and terror to prosperity, and I will kiss thy detestable bones, and put my eyeballs in thy vaulty brows, and wring these fingers with thy household worms, and stop this gap of breath with fulsome dust, and become a carrion monster like thyself. Come, grin on me, and I will think thou smilest, and bust thee as, a, as thy wife. Misery's love, oh, come to me. We might note the obsessiveness with which Constance repeats herself and describes this longed-for union with death, which she describes in uh, quasi-erotic sexual terms as well. Also note her use of apparent oxymorons. Lovely death, odiferous stench, sound rottenness. Odiferous, which means something that smells good, but it's a stench, which normally uh, suggests a negative smell. Sound, which means um, well put together, something that is solid but it's rotten. Rotten is something that is, of course, falling apart. So these uh, paradoxical images that she uses to describe death and uh, that express her desire for death. In response to the accusation that she's gone mad, Constance replies, I am not mad. This hair I tear is mine. My name is Constance. I was Geoffrey's wife. Young Arthur is my son, and he is lost. I am not mad. I would to heaven I were, for then tis like I should forget myself. Oh, if I could, what grief should I forget? Preach some philosophy to make me mad, and thou shalt be canonized, Cardinal. For, being not mad but sensible of grief, my reasonable part produces reason how I may be delivered of these woes, and teaches me to kill or hang myself. If I were mad, I should forget my son, or madly think a babe of clouts were he. I am not mad. Too well, too well I feel the different plague of each calamity. So she's perfectly aware of who she is and what has happened to her. And in fact, it is that awareness that drives her grief, not madness. 
It is that awareness of everything that's happened to her that makes her te tear her hair out, that makes her lament her son's loss, that makes her desire death. And she puts it in terms that almost suggests that it's rational, that it's reasonable to want to die from knowing all of these horrible things. And we see just how deep her grief and sense of loss goes when we see how she reflects even on the promise of heaven as not being able to fulfill the loss that she feels from her son. She says, um, Father Cardinal, I have heard you say that we shall see and know our friends in heaven. If that be true, I shall see my boy again. For since the birth of Cain, the first male child, to him that did but yesterday suspire, there was not such a gracious, gracious creature born. So, of course, I will see my son in heaven because he is the most gracious child to ever have been born. He must, he will definitely go to heaven. But, but now will canker sorrow eat my bud and chase the native beauty from his cheek. And he will look as hollow as a ghost and dim and meager as an ague's fit. And so he'll die. And rising so again, when I shall meet him in the court of heaven, I shall not know him. Therefore, never, never must I behold my pretty Arthur more. So she anticipates her son suffering, even knowing that he will, she might see him in the afterlife. She anticipates his suffering on earth will change him so much that even in heaven, she won't know him. So there's nothing, not even God can give her back her child. We see that this is uh, just a, a, a true depth and intensity of grief, of sorrow that Constance is suffering from. And when she's chastised for being too attached to her grief, she responds, grief fills the room up of my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. Then have I reason to be fond of grief? Grief is all she has. Grief is the only presence of her son. Even though her son is absent, the grief at that absence is something. It brings back some feeling, brings him back in a sense. The materials of memory here bring back the presence of the absent son while at the same time reminding her of his absence. And so Constance leaves. The King of France follows her in order to prevent her from doing some outrage upon herself. This uh, anticipates a similar scene when Ophelia goes mad in um, Hamlet, one of Shakespeare's later plays. So we're left with Lewis and Pandolf. And Lewis, after seeing this sad scene of Constance gone mad, uh, continues his father's lament. There's nothing in this world can make me joy. Life is as tedious as a twice told tale, vexing the dull ear of a drowsy man. And bitter shame hath spoiled the sweet word's taste, that it yields not but shame and bitterness. And this again anticipates another one of Shakespeare's later plays. This sounds much like the language that Macbeth uses uh, near the end of the play Macbeth when everything is falling apart around him. Endolf responds, however, before the curing of a strong disease, even in the instant of repair and health that fit, the fit is strongest. Evils that take leave on their departure most of all show evil. So he says, using the language of physical health, going back to this comparison between the state of the, or the, the body politic and the physical body, the human body. He says, before you get better, right before you get better, that's when you feel the sickest. Now, whether this is true or not is, is not so much the case, but it is a, a kind of bit of common wisdom, commonplace wisdom perhaps. But what Pandolf really is doing is saying, even though things look terrible now, that's actually not the sign of something terrible to come. The, what the terrible situation now means is that something better is to come. In other words, he's interpreting the current events to mean the opposite of what they appear. He continues, when fortune means to men most good, she looks upon them with a threatening eye. So in other words, again, the reference back to fortune, that image of fortune as a woman and uh, a woman whose uh, will can be mysterious and hard to understand. When she looks on you, when she appears to be uh, punishing you, that's when she means to do you the most good. Pandolf tries to explain himself to Lewis. Now hear me speak with a prophetic spirit, makes the claim to be speaking prophecy, to be interpreting the times the way a prophet does, interpreting God's will 
or in this case fortunes will in the events of history in the events of, of the uh, uh, period around you now hear me speak with a prophetic spirit for even the breath of what i mean to speak shall blow each dust each straw each little rub out of the path which shall directly lead thy foot to england's throne and therefore mark so his words will clear a path to the kingship john hath seized arthur and it cannot be that whilst warm life plays in that infant's veins the misplaced john should entertain an hour one minute nay one quiet breath of rest a scepter snatched with an unruly hand must be as boisterously maintained as gained and he that stands upon a slippery place makes nice of no vile hold to stay him up that john may stand then arthur needs must fall so be it for it cannot but be so so he says he, he's telling us what we've already seen or telling lewis what we the audience have already seen john cannot feel secure in the throne while arthur is still alive and thus his potential claim is still alive so arthur, uh, john that is is going to have arthur killed pandolf can foresee it he explains his reasoning through uh, first a political principle a scepter snatched with an unruly hand must be as boisterously maintained as gained so he must protect his unlawful crown the, the crown that he grabbed unlawfully that he has usurped according to pandolf and arthur and the others in order to protect that he has to protect it the same way that he grabbed it unlawfully violently so in a sense pandolf is pointing out the paradox of violent power that violent power requires more violent power in order to maintain itself in some sense then as a form of authority or as a principle on which to base authority on which to base right violent power is always somewhat self-contradictory or self-defeating lewis doesn't quite understand what uh pandolf is getting at what shall i gain by young arthur's fall you in the right of lady blanche your wife may then make all the claim that arthur did through your wife you can make a claim to the throne and lose it life and all as arthur did lewis replies pandolf here how green you are and fresh in this old world he finds lewis just to be so young and naive and innocent so he has to instruct him in the ways of the world somewhat ironic i think that the cardinal is here instructing a uh, 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 prince a dauphin in the ways of the world the cardinal who is supposed to be one would expect attuned to spiritual matters is very good at machiavellian politics pandolf reiterates himself john lays you plots the times conspire with you the events he's interpreting the events that are going on as leading to a certain narrative as telling a certain narrative that will lead lewis to the throne that's the plot that is being laid for him and he reiterates again the paradox of violent power for he that steeps his safety in true blood shall find but bloody safety and untrue right acts to ensure one's safety through violence only lead to more violence and undermine that safe that very safety itself why is this pandolf explains this act the act of murdering arthur so evilly born shall cool the hearts of all his people and freeze up their zeal that none so small advantage shall step forth to check his reign but they will cherish it the people will see this murder as something horrific something evil and so they will no longer love john they will not feel loyalty to him and thus anyone who wants to come to uh, uh, to take the throne from john the people will support furthermore their new dislike of john their new coolness towards him and anger at his evil actions will cause them to interpret the world around them as telling them to overthrow john no natural exhalation in the sky no scope of nature no distempered day no common wind no custom event customed event but they will pluck away his natural cause and call them meteors prodigies and signs abortives presages and tongues of heaven plainly denouncing vengeance upon john so their desire to overthrow john their desire for someone else will cause them to read in the signs of nature around them the will of god telling them overthrow john Lewis raises a, a point maybe he will not touch young arthur's life but hold himself safe in his imprisonment maybe he won't kill arthur uh, and then what pandolf replies oh sir when he shall hear of your approach if that young arthur be not gone already even at that news he dies 
and then the hearts of all his people shall revolt from him and kiss the lips of unacquainted change and pick strong matter of revolt and wrath out of the bloody fingers ends of john now let's think a minute about pandolf's plan here and what he's been telling lewis he says to lewis john will kill arthur the english people will thus turn against john so then you can invade england and the people will support you so he's he lays out a certain lo logic of cause and effect but now lewis says well what if he doesn't kill arthur then pandolf says well when you invade england then john will kill arthur hearing of your invasion thus turning the people against him thus justifying your invasion so notice how subtly cause and effect have changed and now arthur's death is not something that john is doing of his own accord and that lewis is responding to but in some sense pandolf has made lewis uh, the cause of arthur's death saying well why don't we invade then john will kill arthur then the people will support you so pandolf's reasoning here pandolf's motivation is purely political this isn't about saving arthur or this isn't about vengeance for for john's acts this is about giving lewis authority and also about the pope's uh, war the church's war against john describing the uh, revolt pandolf says methinks i see this hurley all on foot and oh what better matter breeds for you than than i have named the bastard falconbridge is now in england ransacking the church offending charity if but a dozen french were there in arms they would be as a call to train ten thousand english to their side or as a little snow tumbled about anon becomes a mountain so pandolf references very briefly john's uh command earlier in the act to ransack the church to take its wealth and he says this is an even better um matter and another reason for you to invade that will get the people on your side if we had any doubt about pandolf's uh motivations he says go with me to the king tis wonderful what may be wrought out of their discontent so he's there using the discontent of the people to make to to create something good to craft something wonderful for themselves uh, so what we see what we see pandolf doing is really coming up with excuses with justifications for the invasion after the fact that is to say pandolf wants the invasion to happen and so he has to find reasons to justify it and to convince the dauphin that it's going to be successful rather than they found reasons the things that john has done wrong and so they're invading in response to that lewis for his part is convinced even though he does seem to display some awareness that this is perhaps a strange course of action not not the uh most rational or or obvious course of action to take strong reasons make strange actions he says so the act ends uh with yet another conflict the act that begun with that had begun with england and france unified joining together in marriage now ends with them um, having gone through one war uh, apparently or one battle apparently now about to engage in another conflict as now france will be invading england so to review in this act we've seen again the theme of cobbled together unions uh, attempting to link together competing interests that then uh, become frayed and fall apart we've also seen a repetition of john as the effective leader and uh, an example of england's might in the actions of the bastard however we also have the suggestion of a couple of possible turning points there's uh, of course the long discussion between hubert and the king um, and then discussion between pandolf and lewis both of which center primarily on the figure of arthur and his life or death suggesting that that is going to be one of the primary events and of course it is primary event in the play but a primary event in the turning point of this conflict between england and france as it turns out it's not that important and it's the much more uh minor throwaway uh action of john commanding the bastard to ransack the church's coffers and take their money that ends up being what brings john down ultimately so we have both the obvious center of the story and then the event that is the more historical cause and effect um, and so the conflict between what makes a good story and what is meaningful as a story versus um the perhaps random and, and and confusing and haphazard succession of events as they occur in real life 
So with that in mind, I will end this presentation on Act 3 of King John. I will see you in the King John Act 4 video. If you have any questions, feel free to email, comment, uh, you know how to get in touch. Otherwise, have a great day and I will see you soon. Take care.